what, what they did to start with was that they take this substance and they, they could see that it was a combination substance, some of which was just nasty black stuff, but within it there were these white elements that, that really seemed to show up within it, and they wanted to know what they were, because this seemed to be the thing that was the, the problem. So they, they took it into the lab, they, they, they cleaned it all up, they, they actually got this stuff out of the black material into a precipitate, and, and what they then had to do was to dry that out so that they could test it. Well, the f strangest thing was happening. They, they decided the best way to dry it was simply to take the filter papers and put them out in the sunshine, just to put them outside. The moment they did that, it exploded. Now, it hadn't been that the farmland had been exploding, but the moment they separated this material and put it in the sun, something about the heat or the light exploded it. And it was explained as if it was like a flash of 40 or 50,000 flash bulbs all going off at once. Not only that, it disappeared. And they thought, well, that's, that's really strange. You know, is this an Im implosion or an explosion? What, what's going on here? It's like a great blast of this light. So they took an unsharpened pencil and just stood it on end uh, in the sample, in the, in the filter paper, just stood it there. Bang, white light, it's gone. The pencil's still there. It hasn't blown over. It's not been affected by this. There's no blast. So they said, okay, this needs cleverer testing than we've got. So up they go to Cornell University. Now at Cornell at that time, they, they said that they got this amazing new equipment, and this equipment could test anything that you'd got down to three to five parts per billion. So they put it on their machines, and they came back and they said, it's iron and silica and aluminum. And they said, well, it can't be. None of those things disappear in a blaze of white light. No, I mean, none of them have these properties. There must be more to it than that. So they, they tested them again, and, and they discovered that actually the, the reading that they were getting was, was just a little impurity at the front level. It was reaching the boiling point of these particular substances. And once they got rid of them, and they were less than 1% of the whole, once they got rid of them and tested 99% plus of the sample, they said, we can tell you exactly what you've got pure nothing. You have nothing that our machine will read, it will, not, it will not acknowledge that there's anything on there being tested. It's nothing. So they said, okay, we'll try arc emission spectroscopy. Very, very simple process. Two electrodes, the bottom one has a cup in it, you place your sample in the bottom cup, you bring the other one down and you strike an arc. That arc heats up and ionizes what's in the sample, and one by one, as it reaches the boiling temperatures of each of the constituent elements, it will read them off and tell you what's there. So if, for example, you, were, you, were, you put a, a motor car engine in there, its first reading would tell you it was water, because it was reading the cooling system. When the water had all boiled away, it would then tell you it was metal. So that's the way it works. So anyway, they put the stuff in there, and um, the same thing happened. They said it, said it was iron, silica, and aluminum, and that was it. Nothing was recognizing it. it. It was not listed. It was totally unknown to science, this strange white material that would disappear from vision. Well, then the Russians came along. The Soviet Academy of Sciences. We're now in, in, into the 1980s, well into the 1980s, and the Russians said, We've been telling you guys in the West for the longest time, you really haven't got much of a clue when it comes to analysing materials. Your electrodes burn away before you can reach the boiling temperature of some of your materials. Carbon has a lower boiling temperature, these electrodes are made of carbon, they're burning away before whatever it is has heated up enough, so it's not reading it. Russians said you need to burn this in an arc for 300 seconds, not 15, which was common in the West. 300, five minutes. So they go back to base and they put the material in and it begins. Within 15 seconds, iron, silica, aluminum. They all expected that and then it's nothing. But the arc now is carrying on burning, whereas the Western style one stopped. And suddenly, at 70 seconds, it says it's palladium. After palladium, reads platinum. After that, as the various boiling temperatures were reached, came ruthenium. Rhodium, iridium, and at 220 seconds, osmium. Every one of the platinum group metals was in this substance. 
It was them. It just wasn't showing up at them as them in a metallic way. And in fact, when they worked out the content of these soil samples, it was discovered that per ounces of substance per tonne of soil, they had seven and a half thousand times more platinum in every tonne of their soil than they were getting from every tonne in the best platinum mine in South Africa. But it wasn't metal. You couldn't make jewellery with it. And suddenly Hudson discovered that General Electric up in Massachusetts were looking at a new, new sort of fuel cell technology. And he said, look, I, I, I've got this stuff here, and, and it says in your literature that you're, you're using rhodium and iridium and these platinum group metals uh, for fuel cells. Your reports say that you're experiencing very strange phenomena. You're, expecting, you're, you're, you're experiencing blazing white lights and explosions and disappearing tricks and things. And they said, yeah. And he said, well, I've got some stuff that does that. And they said, yeah, don't, don't worry about the white light explosions. We know all about those. Don't worry about the disappearing tricks. We know all about those. And he said, great, tell me all about them. And they said, no, I mean, we don't understand them. We just know about them. We know that it happens. And that's where we're leaving it. You know, we're, it happens. We, we don't want to understand it. We want to make fuel cells. Well, David wanted to understand it. It was then decided that, that since this stuff was going to be proven as a kind of material that could be used in fuel cells, they said you ought to get down to the patent office and lodge a patent on this. You know, you need to, to lodge it because somebody else could discover it and stop you from working with it. So that's what he did. And, and there's a portion in the application where you have to do tests with weights and measures. Well, the funny thing about this material was that they'd noticed that it was, its weight was fluctuating. So he, he said, well, like when, you know, what stage do we weigh it? And they said, well, you're just going to have to keep heating it and cooling it and heating it and cooling it and seeing what the mean weight is. So they got this machine, which is called a thermogravimetric analyzer, and they started doing this weighing. Well, it was actually quite remarkable. They managed to get readings during heating that took it to a weight of less than zero. They managed to get readings during cooling that took it to anything up to 700 times its original weight. Think of the Alexandrian Paradise Stone. These powders will outweigh the original quantity of gold. They can also be lighter than a feather. That was exactly what it was doing. But during the process, there was one particular moment, one particular moment in time where the weight fell very quickly and very dramatically at that moment, and it fell by 44% suddenly. But what they noticed was something really odd, because the less than zero weight that they were getting didn't make a lot of sense. It was sitting there in a pan in the lab on effectively weighing equipment. The pan itself weighs something. You have to compensate for it before you put the other material in it. But what they discovered was that, that it was reading all of these zero weights, below zero, but they thought, well, what about the pan? That should weigh something. So they tipped the material out and put the pan back, and it suddenly weighed more without the material in it than it did when it was in it. This stuff was not only levitating, it was carrying the pan with it. And they learned that this stuff has the power to give levitational qualities to its host. So they carried on and they thought, well, we've got to do these other things for the application. We've got to see if it's conductive. That was the next test they had to do. So they put wires and electrodes into it, attached them to a voltmeter, turned on the power, nothing. And then they thought, well, it's, it's got to be a conductor of some sort because if it's capable of, of, of holding energy, you know, how are General Electric doing it? You know, it has to be conductive. Anyway, it turned out that it was a superconductor rather than a conductor. Superconductors are very, very strange animals. They don't need contacts to convey to each other. They convey to each other through resonant frequencies, through lights. The interesting thing is that, that if you transmit electricity from A to B with a wire, you always get some dispersion. You always lose some energy. With this, you lose nothing. 100% can go from there to there, no contact in between, 100% stays. 
it works so differently because it doesn't allow voltage potential to exist within itself. Neither does it allow any magnetic um, field to exist within itself. It's totally null. It doesn't react to North Pole, South Pole. It has its own quality, and its own quality defines all the laws. Here we have uh, a, a standard magnet. We have North and South Pole. It's the magnet we all use. It will attract metals. And in fact, even if you put above it something that it won't attract, it'll fall down onto it because gravity will just take it there. That superconductor doesn't. Well, it's nothing to do with it. it. Won't be attracted by it, won't particularly be repelled by it, but it's just placed there above it and it'll just stay wherever it's put. We know that its anti-gravity properties can be translated to its host. We know that the scale of that doesn't seem to matter. It's, it's macrocosm, microcosm, big, small, has nothing to do with these superconductors. So in as much as that, that tons of it will be, were discovered at this, this Egyptian temple, dating back to the fourth dynasty at the time they were building the pyramids, and we know that this stuff was very capable of transferring its weightlessness to the pan in the lab or whatever else one might associate it with, it would be equally as capable of helping them move the most enormous stones to build pyramids which incidentally the stones themselves contain. You don't even have to get them from outside. Sandstones and limestones contain these, these elements in a natural form. And it's very interesting to, to think now that, that of all of the ways that they thought perhaps these stones were moved, none of them have ever worked in experiment or trial. This does. So they discovered that this stuff would levitate, they discovered it would disappear, they didn't quite know why or where it went to, and they knew that it was important for, for energy. They knew that if it was a superconductor it could attract energy, it could store energy and it could distribute energy. Yeah, fuel cell, that's what we're looking at here. The, the old stories of the powder and the Ark of the Covenant began to, to ring bells here about the, there was this potential that they had the ability with the use of this material to store and distribute enormous quantities of energy. So Hudson got very, very, very excited about all this and he went along uh, to the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, and he, he met with the director there, a fellow called Hal Putoff, who many of you might know or know of. And Hal Putoff is, is famous for his studies of zero-point gravity and vacuum energy, that, that sort of thing. What Putoff had established, he'd been working on gravity calculations by the Russian physicist Andrei Sakharov from the 60s, and he'd been working out the mathematics for this, and he'd worked out that that matter was capable of resonating in different dimensions that, that weren't ours. But what he calculated mathematically from Sakharov's work was that the moment it begins to do that, at that moment, the moment you know it's on the change, just hooking into the beginnings of another dimension, it will automatically lose four-ninths of its weight. And Hudson went along, he said, look, this is really interesting because 44% mine's losing, and that's the same, it's the same figure, four ninths. And so um, they agreed, well, yeah, I mean, it's because you're now, this stuff is beginning to resonate in another dimension. That's what's happening to it. It should disappear totally, he was told, if it carries on, and he said, it does. It disappears totally. We don't know where it goes, it just disappears. So they decided to test this. And they said that, look, the way to do it is this. If you have a, a little pile of powder in a pan and it becomes invisible, that means it's still there, but you can't see it. So if you've got a spatula and messed it up in the pan, it would come back, when it comes back, in a mess. Um, but we suspect that yours won't. We suspect it will come back in the same shape that it disappeared in. And that's exactly what happened. It didn't come back in a mess. It came back looking exactly like it had disappeared in that same perfect shape. There you are, they said. It's not invisible. It has simply moved out of our space-time and it's now been brought back into it.